All right. So we had part of the program in the pavilion and part of the program over here in Derby. So we're all, we didn't want anyone's, the people to, in one room to feel they were at the kids' table. So, um, so here we are. Um, I, was, I had this little introduction here that Lee has saved me from because Lee did such a great job of, of introducing George Bellows. I, there's no, I'm sure there's someone that walked in this room tonight that did not know who he was or knew his name but was like, oh, I'm a little, a little fuzzy on those details. Um, but uh, Lee did a good job, I thought, kind of introducing him. Um, and you all have the great honor, and this is good because you don't have to listen to me. You don't really want to, it's not about Nanette, it's about these three people. So you have the great honor of getting to hear wonderful all things Bellows, family stories, from three of George Bellows' grandchildren. Now, to my one side, the gentleman is Michael Kearney, and his sister, Marianne, is sitting to my other side. They are the children of George Bellows' eldest daughter, Anne, who was born in 1911. I looked it up today, so you're, it's amazing, 1911. And on the far end is Lori Booth, who is the daughter of George's younger daughter, Jean. Now, we've, known, we've actually known the three of them for a very long time. We have an interesting relationship with Lori, though, because Lori spent part of her life as a conservator, and she was a conservator that we use quite frequently. So we saw Lori. Actually, that's how I met Lori. Lori I met her as a conservator rather than as George Bellow's granddaughter. So um, since we've got a little bit of taste of who George was, I, we're going to start with Michael, because Michael has been doing a lot of family history, so I thought you'd like to hear how the Bellows family arrived in Columbus, how they, what their background is, how they got here. Michael, take it away. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yeah, it's one of those. It's, uh, oh, it's one of those, okay. <laughs> um, when I talk about, well, many people think of, of George Bellows as being a Midwesterner. I mean, Columbus is in the Midwest. I think Ohio is the first state in the Midwest, um, that the actual, his family, his family is, were not Midwesterners for very long. In fact, they were New Englanders, or more precisely, they were from the east end of Long Island. Uh, the South Fork, as it's sometimes called. Some of you may have heard of the Hamptons, so it was around there. But his, the Bellows family uh, has a, had a long history in New England as sort of yeoman farmers starting in 1630 when John Bellows arrived in Boston and then sort of many generations later moved to eastern Connecticut and then across Long Island Sound to Long Island at which point in the Hamptons um, and in Sag Harbor they were farmers and and George's father also named George was born in a place called Good Ground Long Island which is now called Hampton Bays I like the old name better. Um, and he was, this was in like an eight, he was born in 1827. And around 1850, he came to Columbus with a, uh, with a contractor to build Sterling Medical College. So he was a carpenter and a builder. So he worked, George Bellows Sr. began his career here in Columbus um, as a builder and as a carpenter and built the first medical school, or helped build the first medical school here in Columbus, and stayed um, for the rest of his life, became a sort of a, uh, you know, a prominent member of the community, helped build the Methodist church. He was, you know, all the Bellows were these sort of died in the wool Methodists. There are many Wesleys floating around in our family tree. And he became a well-respected builder, made a good living here in Columbus. Um, married a, a woman, Lucilla Squires, from, also from Long Island, who was his first wife, had a daughter by her named Laura, and then she died, and uh, sort of late in his life, in his 50s, uh, he went back to eastern Long Island and, uh, and married uh, my great-grandmother, Anna Smith, and Anna, Anna Smith lived in Sag Harbor, and her family were all ship captains. They ran little schooners called, they were coasters. They ran up and down Long Island Sound, taking whale oil and other things from Sag Harbor into New York City and bringing goods back and forth 
and uh, Anna's father and had uh, like three brothers, and they were all ship captains. So in any case, sort of in, in her 40s, Anna Smith, you know, left the sea, married George Bellow Sr., and came here to Columbus, and I think to everyone's surprise, <laughs> um, George was born, and it, to, a, to, a, to a pair of, of Yankees, George Bellow Sr. was always referred to as a tight-fisted Yankee. George himself was known, he had sort of a Yankee accent, which again sort of set him aside from, from many of the Midwesterners who had been here a, a bit longer. And, uh, you know, went to, went to Central High School here, graduated, went to Ohio State, stayed three years, and dropped out after his, dropped out okay, in his no, junior Michael, year. Michael, we were always told that he forgot to take his junior year exams. That's what we always say in Columbus. He forgot no, to take his junior no, year no, he exam. Did not, he did not forget. <laughs> He intentionally did not take his exams because that then prevented, under the rules of the university at the time, that prevented him from returning for at least a year. He could not come back and take his exams again. So we had to sit out at Ohio State for at least a year, at which point his father, who was not too enthusiastic about, about George's desire to become an artist, um, gave in. and. Uh, and helped support him when he went off to, to school and start his career in, uh, in New York City. So the Bellows family, though, ha so has been here in Columbus, starting with George Sr., since, since 1850, and has been part of the community uh, ever since that time, even though we don't all live here now. Certainly, this is, in many ways, all of these exhibitions that we, are, we have the privilege of going to are ways of bringing us back home, so I get I got to have family reunions with my sister and my cousins, but also reunions with all these wonderful, wonderful paintings and prints that we get to see in the flesh um, every five years or so when one of these special events happens. So I want to thank Nanette and the museum and, and all of you for, for attending and, and supporting the, the, um, the George Bellows Center. I hope you come and take advantage of um, the learning opportunities, and there's still much, much more to know about him and his contemporaries. So I think with that, I'll, I'll stop in, talking. In fact, we, sh we should use this as opportunity. The very first um, public program that the George Bellows Center will sponsor will, will, um, is going to be Charles Brock, who is the American curator at the National Gallery in Washington. He did the great Bellows retrospective a few years ago. And he's coming on November 4th, Thursday evening, November 4th. And he will be doing a, a wonderful lecture on George Bellows. It'll be the first program. And that's the point that we'll have the center open to the public. So that's exciting. Well, we started, to, we decided what kind of questions we would ask. And this is, so I said, what do you usually ask? And everybody laughed and said, I said, so what are the things you guys are asked the most? Marianne, what are the things you're always asked? Do you paint? To which Michael usually says, yes, I can do a double hung window in an, in an hour, two coats. <laughs> so, I like to say, I, I, I think I mentioned this once before, um, there are a lot of gifts that he had that I think are well distributed throughout any number of the grandchildren. The one thing none of us have is the fire in the belly, and it makes all the difference in the world, and any artist, musician, whoever <clears throat> will know that. Um, he had it, and we don't. So uh, in some ways, we're grateful we don't, simply because we had choices, and he didn't. So That's true. You really don't have choices when you have the fire in the belly. You got to do it. You got to live it. I mean, All right, so you get asked whether you paint. What else do you guys get asked? You got a couple oh, of other ones. What's your favorite painting? My favorite painting is probably Emma at the Piano, which was painted in Monhegan in 1914 just in wild shades of blues and blacks. I adored my grandmother. She was an idol to me. It's a beautiful painting, and I always love it because that summer he went to Monhegan and was hoping to replicate all the seascapes he had done this, the year before, and it rained the whole time, and he was frustrated and angry that he couldn't do what he wanted to do, and he ended up painting some of the most beautiful portraits he ever painted. He painted the, the daughters of several of the fishermen and the locals, uh, just beautiful, beautiful stuff, including Emma at the piano, which is one of my favorites. How about you? Yep. Well, it's, 
actually been shown several times already. So put it, you have to put these really close to your mouth. Ah. Okay, I'm sorry to say that, but that's the way they work. That's true. Churn and break. Churn and break. Oh, churn and break. Now, Monhegan seascapes are I, to die for, as far as I'm concerned. And most of the paintings he did on Monhegan Island, the, the sea really spoke to him. And you can really see it in those. In those. And there, he did quite a few. It was yep. very prolific on Monhegan. Uh, how, how many did he do? Yeah. Well, talk about that exactly manic summer. The, talk about the summer that you called the manic summer. Manic. I called it the manic summer. 1913, they went to Monhegan. My mother was two years old. Emma went with them. He painted, I think the count was something like 148 canvases. Not just some of them small studies, but some pretty major stuff too. And he was very pleased. And uh, any of you who have seen some of the seascapes, he really believed that he had finally captured color in, the, in those studies that he did on Monhegan. And the colors are just magnificent. They're beautiful, beautiful paintings. So. That's a remarkable number of paintings to do in a summer. I mean, that just really is. I mean, being the good practical person that I am, I kept thinking, how would you transport 148 paintings from Monhegan Island to Manhattan? And I, I have no idea how they did that. In the era of the horse and wagon, there were no automobiles at that point. So, yeah. But that actually just goes to the point that um, George believed very strongly that you didn't dwell. You, you, that instant impression, you didn't, you didn't overwork things. And one of the favorite things I remember my mother telling me about the way George painted was that you were never, I don't think he ever sat down to do anything, especially not to paint. He was always standing when he was painting. And my mother always said, whenever you look at a bellows, you must never look at it closely. You must stand at least eight or nine feet away to see the painting properly. And the way he would paint would be, he would stand back, look at the canvas, and then he would dodge forward, because he, he was an athlete. He almost was recruited. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you? I'm sorry. He was almost recruited by the Cincinnati Reds as a professional baseball player. So, and that's one of the things I think we all love about him, was that he was, he was athletic. He was so athletic, and so many of his paintings reflect the love for sport that I think we all appreciate. But my mother said that that was the way he painted. He would rush forward, paint really fast, stand back. So he was always in motion and, and never stood close except to, to apply the paint. So I thought that yeah. was the perfect analogy of the way he saw life and the way he... And the painted. athleticism was not natural. And I don't know how many of you know the story, but it goes back to Columbus. Um, he had older parents. His mother dressed him in very frou-frou kind of clothing, and he was at school, and he was brutalized at school, and uh, he was beaten up and got into all kinds of fist fights. And he he consciously decided that the way he would be accepted by his peers was if he could play baseball. So he he actually went to one of the local teams on the street. Uh, the brownies was it? Was it the brownies were early? And he convinced them to let him on the team if, the, if he could get their write-ups of their games into the local newspaper rag. And otherwise, they would never have let him in. And literally, over a period of months, I'm not sure how long, but he never played. And he would just stand on the sidelines and play catch and retrieve anybody that would play catch with him. And he learned to be an excellent fielder. And sure enough, one day, someone didn't show up. And they put him in the game. And by the time they went to Ohio State in their sophomore year, I, some huge number, like five of the nine players on the Ohio State baseball team were brownies, including George. So it was that conscious drive to decide, I'm going to do this, because he was gangly, awkward. It was not natural. And he also became an excellent basketball player. So it was that kind of drive and that kind of focus that he had. Yeah, he played baseball, basketball, and then he was also on the yearbook staff, right? He did the, the Macchio. So, I mean, it's that breadth. I mean, and, and I never knew this until you all were talking about it the other. Talk about his carpentry skills and design skills. Talk about, I don't think I knew this at all. Well, his father nope. was a builder, I mean, should not and uh, in the summers, he would teach George his trade, and, and George learned how to build furniture, and he helped 
designed and built his house in Woodstock with the assistance of some others. Built in furniture, all the cabinets he built, um, chest of drawers. I mean, he did it all. He was really an excellent carpenter. That shouldn't be a surprise, right? Because of his father, yeah. Right. Well, let's talk about Emma. Um, I think one of the things that doesn't get enough attention of the, is the role of wives and often widows in shaping the careers of the person they loved, the talented, incredible person that they knew. And Emma played an incredibly important role in all of your lives, in a way, but also in the George Bellows we now know and you see around the world when you go to museums. Talk a little bit about Emma and, and her commitment. I probably, of us, all of us, I probably knew Emma the best <clears throat> because I was the only girl. And I think I told the story earlier. Emma didn't do little boy energy really very well. <laughs> and my mother didn't do four children really very well. <laughs> so in the summers, I was the one that got shipped off to Woodstock or to New York City to stay with Emma for really extended periods of time. And she was an enigma. She was one of the most liberal and one of the most conservative people I have ever known, <laughs> all in one. <laughs> and uh, we like to talk about the world according to Emma. I'll say one of her examples was, you do not have oriental carpets because they, they conflict with the art. And you're going, OK, so that was the world according to Emma. But she was a force. And my understanding, I knew her, of course, in later years, that when she was married, before she was widowed, she was very lighthearted and enjoyed the parties and socializing and the rest. But after he died, she became very serious. People would, would sort of complain that she had lost her humor. Uh, but she spent, the, after he died in 1925, she spent the rest of her life raising her two children, obviously, and promoting intentionally the ordered sale and management of his work, placing things intentionally with particular collectors, particular museums. Um, one of my favorite stories is about Dallas in, in the late years of her life. There was a painting uh, which she had marked not for sale, and it was a painting, a portrait of her in a purple silk dress that she had made. And there were two versions of this, but she had one of them. And in those later years, she recognized she wasn't going to live that much longer, and what was she going to do with this painting? So she decided to sell it to the Dallas Museum of Art. And the reason she made that decision was there were no major paintings west of the Mississippi until you got to Los Angeles. So her intention in putting it in Dallas was to have a painting west of the Mississippi. <laughs> so that's how her mind worked. And uh, I say, I adored her. I, she was an idol to me, um, <clears throat> a quiet person. But I think without her, I'm not sure George's work would have been as intelligently placed uh, as ordered. The sales were always orderly. You never flooded the market all at once. And uh, so she, for the rest of her life, supported her children and managed this work. And I can name two or three friends of George who had no children, no family. And their work has pretty much been forgotten. And some of it's quite good. And, but they did not have those advocates to push it to a, a new level. So for her, I'm very grateful to have known her. And I do believe she has a role, major role, in the success of his work over time. Michael. <laughs> Well, I don't quite know what to say about Emma that my sister hasn't already said. Um, but she, she always, she was, I don't know. I have a movie of her slapping my cousin in the head <laughs> when she was older. But I, I think really the, the thing that strikes me most is, you know, after, you know, she was in her, probably in her 40s when George died. Right. She's left with two young daughters to raise, not that much money in the bank, and, and this legacy that she felt that sort of this obligation and duty to continue. And I think much to her credit, you know, her tenacity in successfully you know, raising two daughters 
and continuing to promote the work was was really was really a remarkable thing, um, and you might you know sort of if you had known she came she was born to an upper middle class family she lived in Upper Montclair New Jersey she belonged she and her family belonged to the country club, right she went to art school in, which is where she met George, but but all of that I think sort of sort of went by the wayside, but the the one story I re recall about her she was she was very set in her ways. And there was no such thing as an opinion. <laughs> and um, my Aunt Jean told me the story once, that the biggest fight she ever had with her mother, Emma, was the time when Jean, the, there was a fire in the fireplace, Emma was in the, in the living room, and Jean walks in and turns on the light. And Emma says, don't turn on the light, it makes the fire dimmer. <laughs> And Jean says, oh, mother, don't be ridiculous. Turning on the light doesn't make the fire dimmer. And that was the beginning. <laughs> they, both, they were both insisting, of course, that they were correct. But the uh, turning on the light, as, as a physics major, I can tell you the turning on the light <laughs> does not make the fire dimmer. <laughs> well, I was going to say, in terms of seeing um, the work of George Bellows spread across this country in many, many museums. The other thing that you all got to witness a few years ago was the first work that entered the National Gallery in London. Um, and it is extraordinary. I've, I've seen it hanging in London, and it's so exciting to see it there um, and the show that they did. And it, it's just an amazing story. All right, so we were going to tell, how, how long have we been up here? I, of course, failed to pay attention to that. I was supposed to be 20 minutes. Um, I don't know. But we have to do this. We have to tell favorite stories. So, Marianne, you need to tell the tea party story because it is the best story. Actually, Lori has the equally best story. So everybody has a best story. But I love this story. So, Marianne. This is a, a story my mother actually was very fond of. But I like it because in just a, a sentence, it really sort of sums up what life in that household and the, that world perspective was. And my mother at age six <clears throat> was given a tea set. And every day in the afternoon, she would have a tea party. And she would pr you know, pretend to have guests and pour the tea, but just her and whoever her pretend friends were. So one day, Leon Kroll, the artist, walks in and sees her having her tea party. And he says to her, Oh, and who are your guests today? And my mother says, God, Rembrandt, and Emma Goldman. <laughs> so, that speaks volumes. <laughs> so, so how does a six-year-old, <laughs> you know, you know what she's heard around the dinner table is all I can say. And, yeah, how you make sense of God, Rembrandt, and Emma Goldman is, that's sort of the, the uh, enigma of my family. <laughs> And, Laura, you have to share the story about, with your mother about when you were go, thinking about colleges. Oh. So you heard that I'm a conservator, an art conservator, but when I was very young, my mother, who was a frustrated artist, she was told when she was very young, and she was interested in also becoming an artist, she was told, no, 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 by Emma. You can't possibly think of going into the arts because you will always be compared with your father. And that would not go over very well. So she became an actress instead. So that's another story for another day. But she wanted one of her children desperately to become an artist. And I was the chosen one, uh, which was fine with me because I loved art as well. So I spent my youth drawing, painting, woodcuts, everything I could get my hands on. Loved every moment of it. Went through high school, and then it came time to choose a college, and I was stumped because I had no idea how you choose a college for the arts. It's not like you can go into a catalog and look at ratings, and you know. So we went on a tour of a number of colleges all over the country, and we got to uh, the school I eventually went to, which was Mich Michigan State, which I dare not mention in Ohio, but anyway. 
But they, one of the reasons I was interested in that college was because they had a Master of Fine Arts. So that was one of the things that I thought was important. So my mother went with me, and we had a, uh, a good time going through these. So we were going through, actually, one of the nice things about Michigan State, it has a very nice, I'm assuming it's still there, very nice uh, fine arts building, you know, like uh, multiple stories. So we were getting the tour by the dean, and uh, we were going up past the print department. And all of a sudden, we were walking through the hallways, and I'm looking at my mother. My mother is not an emotional, she was not an emotional person. She, I, I never saw her cry my whole life, literally. Never saw her break into tears my entire life. All of a sudden, I'm looking at her, and is, she's tearing up. And I'm going, either she's having the first allergic reaction I've ever seen, or there's some, something that's terribly wrong. And I was very concerned, and I said, Mama, what's wrong? What's the matter? And she, we had to, we had to get away from everyone because it was a crowd around us. And she finally took me aside and she said, "I didn't realize it, but it was the smell of the printing inks. The smell of the printing ink had brought these evocative memories of her father printing with Bolton Brown in the studio in, in New York, and it had, it had overcome her, you know, with this emotion because she was such a young girl when my grandfather died." So it was, it was quite remarkable and, and quite unexpected. But I, to this day, I will never forget the look, you know, the, the look on her face when uh, she smelled that, that wonderful evocative over of the sprinting ex at Michigan State. So. Well, now many of us in this room know George Bellows as a painter, but George Bellows was also an extraordinary lithographer. By the time George Bellows came of age as an artist, lithography had become such a commercialized medium um, that uh, artists avoided it. And really, George Bellows is usually credited with saving lithography for the art world, for artists. And if you get to go to the Bellows Center, which is just right over there, you'll want to look. One of the framed lithographs that we're showing tonight is of their New York home. George is on the ground, is on the first floor of the home, painting a, a portrait of Emma. And on the second floor, you'll see a man doing something, and that's Bolton Brown doing, uh, using the lithography press upstairs. And it's Christmas, and they're all there. And so that's, I wanted to say that because that's the inky, the, the printing ink. Um, I'm gonna let Michael tell the final story. Can you tell the Pinnell story? But I'm gonna tell my story first. I have one story. <laughs> Um, and it's a great Bella story. Um, I never knew Anne. I never had um, the privilege, but um, I did know Jean, um, who I called Mrs. Booth when she came. I was a young curator. She came a few times. Um, and one time I was walking with her through the galleries, and we were looking at the museum's John Sloan. We have, a, we have two John Sloans. The one we were looking at was the one of Greenwich Village where the young women are digging in the garden. And we were standing there. And she took her hand up very slowly and sort of touched her hair in this kind of very interesting way. And I said, what is it, Mrs. Booth? And she said, I, it's, I have a memory, it's a very, again, a physical memory. And I said, what is it? And she said, well, this is the story. Um, my parents knew the Sloans. And one night they were coming to dinner. And um, my mother always had trouble getting my hair to be the way she wanted it to be, you know, when guests came. And she was tugging at my hair and pulling it to, you know, to get it to, you know, to put the ribbon in it to get it to look the way she wanted. And she said, so she said, I, I just physically feel that pulling on my hair. And she said, so this particular evening, my mother finally gets my hair the way she wants. And she twirls me around and she looks me in the eye and says, the Sloans are coming to dinner. Be nice to Mr. Sloan. He hasn't sold a painting. <laughs> and the background of that is that, that George Bellows, in his, uh, you know, George Bellows was beloved in his day as well as now, and he really could sell paintings. The John Sloan just had a devil of a time selling paintings. He could never sell paintings. And so this, this idea of, you know, be nice to Mr. Sloan. Well, the final story is going to be the Joseph Pinnell story, but you have to tell them a little bit about the murder of Edith Cavell. They won't know all of that. But take right. it away, Michael. Okay, so the year is um, maybe 1915, and, and uh, World War I is going on. And um, 
America is neutral, but there, there are sort of competing, there are competing narratives in the United States about the nature of the war. And one of the things that happened at that time, or in 1914 and 15, was the Germans, the Germans had invaded Belgium, and there was a lot of press about the depredations of, uh, of the German army against uh, civilians in Belgium. And American artists, I think, were, were sort of, were, they were, everyone was shocked at the butchery. And I think the, the, uh, the whole American art community had, a, many of the artists had extreme difficulty in sort of dealing with this thing, the kind of thing that they had really never been called on to deal with, and, and viewing it from afar. Right, because uh, they weren't there in Europe while all of this was going on. But one of, the, one of the major events that happened during that time was that an English nurse named Edith Cavell um, was treating prisoners in a hospital, in a hospital in Belgium. But the, the hospital itself was in, a, in an area that was under German control, but she was there as a neutral, um, you know, Tending, tending to in, uh, wounded English soldiers, but it appears that on the sly she was helping them escape. They denied it at the time, but I think the truth is she was helping them to escape, and the Germans discovered this and basically um, called her a, a traitor and sentenced her to death. And so, in fact, she was, she was kept in prison and trotted out and put before a firing squad and shot. Um, and of course, this this was very this the story came across the ocean, and it was it was all, you know, it was very um, controversial, and it, it whipped up a lot of anti-German sentiment here in the United States. But uh, George was affected deeply by by the stories that came across. So he did he did a series of lithographs uh, pertaining to the um, to the the German war atrocities in Belgium, and even today. You can't, many of them you can't really look at uh, because they're so bad. But one, one subject which he did both a painting and prints of was uh, Edith Cavell. And there's a painting called The Murder of Edith Cavell. Uh, and it's not the firing squad. It's her sort of coming out of her cell in this uh, sort of renaissance, this renaissance composition where she's sort of standing at the top of a stairway in the light and coming down. It's a, it's a very effective painting and print. So the artists at the time would get together and discuss these things and Joseph Pennell, who was one of uh, Bellow's um, contemporaries, was at some kind of a seminar and giving a talk that Bellows was attending. And Pennell was of the opinion, which he loudly expressed, that you know, if you're going to do historical works, it was really better was really better if you were there to witness. So, and he, he called George out. He says, I really think that uh, the murder of Edith Cavell would have been a much better work if the artist had been there. And sort of the room gets silent. And without missing a beat, George says, oh, I wasn't aware that Leonardo had a ticket to the Last Supper. Right? And, and the following irony is, is that Joseph Pennell went on to, uh, to produce some of the most vicious propaganda posters of World War, of World War I, which included one with, which showed uh, German air uh, biplane bombers over New York City bombing the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> I like that story. I love that story. Um, well... I think we will close, and I hope you will all join me in thanking uh, the Bellows family for being with us this evening. I think most of us have finished our dinner. Um, I think there, there's going to be coffee and dessert. There's also going to be dessert down in Chaco. Please, the galleries are all open. The new Bellows Center, just right there on the east side of, uh, of uh, Broad Street Lobby. Go enjoy the Amina show. There's not much time left, only 10 days. So enjoy, and thank you again for all coming out tonight and supporting the museum. We really appreciate it. <laughs>